This week's show with Mercedes Boyer of Rogue Needlepoint is sponsored by the Embroiderers Guild of America and Sassy Jack's Stitchery. This year, EGA has expanded its online offerings to include several exciting new features. One is an educational blog series called Embroidery Techniques from Around the World. It delves into the cultural history and origins of several different needlework techniques. So far, the series has featured Hardanger and Sashiko, and every month a new technique will be introduced and explored in depth on the EGA blog. The EGA is now offering a way to join any EGA chapter directly from the EGA website. Simply click on the chapter map and join the chapter closest to you. It's easier than ever to join this growing community of needleworkers and access the classes, virtual lectures, lending library, and projects and events offered by EGA. Learn more at egausa.org. This week's show is also sponsored by Sassy Jack Stitchery, your source for all the new charts from the Nashville market. If you didn't pre-order, Kim will have in stock or be able to quickly order any of the new charts introduced in Nashville. While she's shipping out Nashville orders, Kim and the amazing Everett are putting the finishing touches on the Baird House so the live shopping can begin. Sassy Jacks also has two workshops coming up. In May, the talented Jeanette Douglas will present a virtual workshop, and in June, Hands On Design will present a live workshop. Sign up for those events at sassyjackstitchery.com. Keep up to date with all that's happening by following the Sassy Jacks Facebook group or by subscribing to the Sassy Jacks newsletter. While you're at sassyjackstitchery.com, sign up for the Cosmo Thread Club and join the Sassy Jacks Customer Loyalty Club. Thanks to the folks at EGA and Sassy Jacks for sponsoring this show. And now our conversation with Mercedes Boyer of Rogue Needlepoint. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you are listening to Fiber Talk, the twice-weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week from Rogue Needlepoint, Mercedes Boyer. Mercedes, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Oh, we've got some things to talk about because now you and I have switched spots. So I grew up in Michigan. You grew up uh, just a few miles from where I live now in St. Louis. Now you're in Michigan and I'm in St. Louis. So um, yeah, yeah, interesting, (laughs) interesting there. And you live in, in yeah. my favorite part of the Lower Peninsula by far, up there in that upper northwest quadrant near Traverse City. And, oh, boy, what a what a place to live. That's beautiful. It is. It is. We're so lucky. Yeah. Long winters, but, hey, you know. Um, well, this year wasn't so bad, so yeah. can't complain. It's perfect stitching weather. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's how you look at it. That's right. Yeah. Yep. I'm most fascinated this was the first time I've heard of someone having a degree, Master of Arts in Museum Studies. What? Yes. What? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a funny story. I've always loved history. And when I was in high school, I heard a morning announcement for this local museum that was looking for tour guides. And I thought, well, that sounds like it'd be a fun summer job. So uh, a friend and I went down there and we took a tour. They kind of wanted to show us how it was done. And it was about an hour and a half long inside of a World War II submarine. And we came out of it and she went, there's no way. There's no way I can do this. And I was like, (laughs) oh, my gosh, sign me up. (laughs) So I worked there for seven years. Uh, We did tours and overnights and ran the gift shop and um, just absolutely loved you know, working for um, a historical museum. And um, the first time I got married, my uh, ex-husband was military. So we traveled a little bit. And I was lucky that we settled in a few cities where there were museums that always seemed to need help. And then I decided to go back to school and thought, well, what do I really love to do? And I found a degree for museum studies. And, you know, it, it, you think about what classes it is and, and you I took a whole class on labels and signage and the best font size and colors to use and, you know, all the way to museums and their communities. And um, so it is a legit degree for sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, now, I, now I see the legitimacy then. Okay. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's presentation and really an education thing then. 
Yeah, yeah. There's a huge educational component. You know, you do learn some marketing and um, there's some classes that are with archival and conservation work in museums and just, you know, best practices for how to take care of ancient fibers or, um, you know, old implements. And so there, there really is a whole science behind preservation of history. Hmm. Okay. All right. Cause I thought, well, what, mm-hmm. what could that be? But yeah, I can see that. So then did, did you work, uh, once you got your degree, you spent some time in museums then mm-hmm. uh, actually applying that? Yes. Yes. It was, um, I was lucky enough to find a position, uh, with a, with a museum in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, which no longer exists. Um, but it was a museum dedicated to Coca-Cola memorabilia and it was one person's collection that we showcased. (laughs) And when we moved, um, I decided to, to go back to school and I was in a class called museums in their communities. And we just happened to live in this part of Kansas where an entire town kind of shifted its identity to the wizard of Oz. And it had a Wizard of Oz museum and a winery and an Emerald City Marketplace and Poppy Field Gallery. And I just I, I ended up writing this this whole paper on how this little town has embraced the identity of this museum and celebrate it. And when I got done, um, the director of the foundation offered me a job. Um, mm. So I ran that museum for three years. Please tell me there's a summer parade where some young lady is elected Dorothy of the Year. Close. Um, ah, there okay. was a, an <laughs> annual festival. We called it Oztoberfest. It took place in October. And, um, and this was, so this was 15, 18 years ago. Um, we actually had munchkins from the movie that would come out to the festival. And we would shut down um, the main street in town, which was officially named Road to Oz. You can check that on the Kansas Department of Transportation. Okay. Um, and it was just a whole festival weekend filled with performances of Wizard of Oz and costumes and people. And so it was it was great fun. That's that's pretty neat. I, I used to have a neighbor who was very much into the Wizard of Oz. And uh, I know I didn't, I'm, I'm sure she's made the journey. Um, oh, for sure. It was definitely a mecca <laughs> for Wizard <laughs> of Oz fans. <laughs> Uh, that's great. What fun though. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Yeah. So, all right. So then the needlework, it's interesting. Now you, you say in, in one of your descriptions that your grandmother taught you needlepoint, but it didn't stick. You're not the first one that that's happened to, Uh, (laughs) you know, that, I mean, that's lots of people we've talked to, you know, they start out as kids, get exposed to needlework and then it, it goes away. And then, you know, later on after kids are raised or whatever, uh, it comes back and it's, it's so cool. Cause you know, the seed was planted. So mm-hmm. didn't stick for you, but then how, how is it? It comes back to life to the point where this is what you're doing all the time. Well, um, <clears throat> I used to spend my summers with my grandparents and that was when she taught me knitting and needlepoint, neither which stuck, <laughs> but she made me this beautiful bag and I had all that you would need in order to do it. Um, and it took the pandemic really to, um, kind of re-spark or reignite that spark. Um, that I pandemic, was quitting. I'll tell you, that it pandemic. Was, I know, <laughs> Just... I know. I, I not, obviously not knowing there was a pandemic coming, decided January 1st of 2020 to quit smoking. Ah. So I needed something that would occupy my hands and my time. And, um, I did puzzles for a little while and then went through all the puzzles in the house and, um, you know, you do when, when COVID hit and the shutdown happened, you know, you're all stuck in your homes. And I think I was doing spring cleaning and found the bat the bag that my grandmother had made and oh. pulled out this little canvas project she had drawn out for me actually. And, um, decided to reteach myself that. And it kind of took off from there. I traded one addiction for another. Yeah. Well, Probably made a good choice there, I'm guessing. Yeah, definitely yeah. a trade up. <laughs> yeah. Well that you know, that's interesting. I remember when I was a kid, my dad quit smoking uh, cold turkey. Yeah. And uh I remember uh, for several weeks he would in the middle of the night we'd hear the car drive out the driveway. He couldn't he just couldn't sleep. He had to go do something, so he'd get in the car and go drive for an hour. And mm-hmm. you know, it was just his way of coping with it. So for mm-hmm. you it was that hand thing that a lot of smokers deal with they always have a cigarette in their hand so mm-hmm. this gave this gave you that 
that outlet? Yes. Yes, exactly. Ah. That's uh that's interesting. And 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 mm-hmm. I I assume it's stuck now. You don't smoke. I do not smoke. Nope. Yay for you. <laughs> yes, best thing I ever did. And you know, I kept joking with people that I thought, gosh, if I could get through a global pandemic without picking it back up, like there's really no excuse now. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. So yeah, no, definitely yeah. a quitter and proud of it. Well, good for you. Yeah. And 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 look at all the money you can pour into needlework. Um, I know. Like yeah. I said, I traded one addiction for another. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think I spend more money on needlework than I did on cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. Well, join the club there. That's a big. That's a big group of people. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. I know I'm not alone. <laughs> yeah. So this, I'm so fascinated by. So it's needlepoint, but uh, uh, you mentioned that that painted canvases didn't provide a challenge for you, so you went just did your own thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd love to say it happened quickly, but it didn't. You know, I. Um, kind of floundered around a little bit. I did a lot of quilt square looking things, just experimenting with stitches and patterns and colors. And um, my husband had ordered me a kit online because again, we were stuck at home and, you know, he wanted to encourage, you know, not only the needlework, but the not smoking. And um, I think it was about halfway through that I went, you know what? I'm not going to use white. Like it tells me to use white. I'm going to use a sparkly white. And I thought, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm a total rebel. And <laughs> by the time I got done, I was like, yeah, I mean, it's it's fine. You know, it just I just didn't feel, yeah, I just didn't feel challenged. I didn't feel like there was any of my creativity in there other than the sparkly white thread, which is a pain in the butt to work with. But yeah, <laughs> I, I persevered because <laughs> I was stubborn. <laughs> well, that's, and, inter- you know, that's yeah. interesting because we encourage people in a lot of shows to, you know, do something with a design to make it yours. Mm-hmm. And so you, right out of the gate, then if essentially right out of the gate, that's what you were doing. Yes. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And, and part of that comes from my job at the time, I was executive director for an, uh, a nonprofit art center and gallery. So I was constantly surrounded by artists, you know, always discussing how to make work your own, you know, really to push the envelope to really go outside your comfort zone and, you know, and, and make art for a reason. And, you know, so there was always kind of that push and pull internally with me too, that, you know, I wanted to see how I could make it mine and how I could push it to really be, um, you know, bigger than, than it is. Yeah. So, okay. So the culture drove that, cause that's usually the biggest hump for people is, mm-hmm. is just to break through that, that wall or get over that hurdle or whatever it is of of not following what the original designer put down on paper and right and you know and, and being willing to have failures and say oh that didn't work tear it out and do yep. something else yeah exactly so you I were, learned early on what frogging was yeah yeah so you were immersed <laughs> in that culture then of who cares try it again yeah exactly you know and I had I had nothing to prove except for to myself and I mean I had all the time in the world since we were at home and um <laughs> So, yeah, I kind of, it was just a, I guess, a perfect storm of circumstances that led to that kind of epiphany of mine going, well, I want to do it my way. Yeah. Do do you have an art background or just in the genes? Um, I've always been creative. I've always been crafty. Um, my grandmother, who I learned from, uh, was an artist. She actually graduated from Washington University and um, worked in fashion design. So I've always been surrounded by artists and art, um, but I never really considered myself an artist. But the thinking is there that, yeah, the culture. Again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. For sure. Interesting. So, so what if, or let's try this is just for you, just normal mental process. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's all right. No, that's, yeah. uh, that puts you ahead of a lot of people. A lot of people just can't get past that. Um, yeah. It's, it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. They're afraid and it's to okay look. to be a little rebellious, you know, a little bit rebellious <laughs> in your, in your art. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, so the, the needle point, you stick with the needle point. Did, did you try other techniques or is it just always been? I did try just like embroidery on just regular fabric. And I found I really enjoyed the constraints of the needle work canvas. 
Um, I liked being able to um, have some, a little bit more control over placement. And I think that comes from initially in college, I was an engineering major. So uh, there it is. I like, yeah, <laughs> <There it is. laughs> I like the order and the rigidity of needlepoint canvas and then just to kind of embellish it from there. So um, I didn't, I thought embroidery was too loosey goosey for me. I, I needed some constraint and I found that with the needlepoint canvas and the smaller, the better. So, um, okay. I don't, I don't care for 12 or 13 or 14 and I, I work mostly in 18. And so, okay. Yeah, no, I know that feeling. Cause I, I do, I'll do anything. And when it comes to embroidery or cruel work where you can put that needle anywhere you want, it's, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a mental adjustment for me to, Oh wait, I can't, I, I don't have a hole that it has to go in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> So a creative engineer then. All right. Yeah. All right. We'll take that. Yeah. So then, all right. So, so then you start to say, all right, I'm going to create my own things. And it's mm-hmm. a fascinating process. So you start with photos. Yeah. So the first one I found, I was just scrolling through Facebook and it was of Sleeping Bear Dunes, which is just north of me. Um, and I thought, you know, that's a really simple composition if you're breaking it down to a lake and some dunes and sky. And I thought, well, I could transcribe that, I think. And at that time, I was still really digging through books and finding stitches that mimicked real life. Um, And so that kind of allowed me to practice with that a little bit. And then when I got done and I put a binding stitch on it and put it in a frame, I felt super, super guilty that that was somebody's photograph that I just took off the Internet and essentially copied. So I went high and low trying to find the author of this image and I just couldn't do it. So that was the last image I sourced off Google uh, for inspiration pictures. Now I use only my own or my husband's or people who I have their permission. (laughs) So um, it was, it was a tough like learning experience that like, yes, I was able to do this, but I did it the wrong way. I guess, you know, if you're looking at the morality of artists. So that one's a tough one for me. But um, yeah. after that, yeah, it was strictly photos of, of mine and my husband's at that point. Yeah, and, and that's a problem. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people just ignore that little aspect, uh, which is so critical. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, like there's a, a stained glass thing at our church that every time I see it, you know, that's, that's a counted canvas design I just need to replicate. And then my mm-hmm. first my first thought is, all right, now I've got to find the artist and get permission. Yeah. Cuz that's you know an artist put that together. And it's yes. like, ah, never mind. <laughs> just <laughs> never mind. <laughs> yeah. 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 And and you you could argue, well, I took the picture and so I no, no, it's an mm-hmm. artist. You got to do it. Yeah. So yeah. then so then you just go traipsing around Michigan. Well, you got plenty of things to take photos of, especially when oh, you're Oh, I do. At, yeah. I do. Yeah. We're, we're never short of inspiration up here. Um, but yeah, it would be, you know, my husband at first would just dig through previous photos he took. Um, and, you know, I looked at different places I had gone. And, and so there, a lot of them were older images. Um, but now I find myself anytime we're out and about, I'll see a vista or I'll see a building and I'll go, gosh, how could I do that? And so I'll just start snapping pictures thinking maybe somewhere down the line, I'll come back to this. Yeah. Now, so your husband is a photographer, painter. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So there you are in that culture again. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. He, uh, he's been a photographer for a long time. He actually um, worked in um, the news. So he's, he's always been very visual. And when we met about, eight years ago, I was running an art center. So I think we both kind of developed each other's creativity through that. Mm -hmm. Does that, okay. So two artists in the same house, do we have Mm -hmm. collaboration? We do a little bit, actually. One of my earliest pieces, I asked him, he used to do these line drawings um, of just shapes and very abstract. And I asked him to make me one and I was going to try and stitch it. And it was great with lots of curves and circles and, that's when I realized how hard those are to do. <laughs> so then I asked him to make me one of only rectangles and squares, <laughs> which is probably cheating a little bit. But 
I was able to take his work and, and put it into fiber form. Um, but other than that, now it's just essentially I'll use some of his photos. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I looked up his art. It's fascinating. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, but very, very different opposite end of the spectrum from you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. actually, it's kind of funny because there'll be a lot of open call shows that we'll both be in. <laughs> and so people are like, Oh, you guys don't do anything anywhere near like, <laughs> no, <laughs> we don't. <laughs> Yeah, his stuff would be stuff to tough to stitch. Yeah. Yeah, he he like I said he did another one um that we actually we were toying with how to put his work onto canvas so that you could stitch directly. Um and I think that was the last time I tried to do any abstract art. Yeah. <laughs> really. So it's yeah, tough. Uh, yeah, the, the grid of canvas doesn't lend itself. Mm -mm. It doesn't really, no. <laughs> but there, but there must be some some color texture uh, feedback back and forth. I would think. Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely, yeah. And and that's the nice thing because usually my work sits out in the living room, so anybody who's there can look at it. You know, while I'm in the middle of it. Whereas I know a lot of artists have their own studios and they cover their paintings or they close the door, but mine's just kind of out there for whoever comes by can see what I'm in the middle of. And, you know, sometimes there's, Oh, well that doesn't look quite right. Maybe you should try this. And, um, you know, from him or my daughter, it's very loving and constructive. So, um, I usually I'll listen. I don't always do it, <laughs> but I will listen. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, at least, at least they have a. They know that they're being heard. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and you have such a fascinating process because when I read that that you take a picture and then translate that to canvas, mm -hmm. I expected a very precise line drawing on the canvas, but you don't do that. You you, from what I could tell, you just basically kind of rough it in and then mm -hmm. then let the thread do the job. Yeah, yeah. And and part of that is how I started that process was I would print the photo on my home printer and then I couldn't figure out, I, you know, I didn't have a light box at the time, but I did have a west-facing storm door. So I would just <laughs> put the photo up on the storm door with the canvas on top and I had to quick trace because you can't hold that position forever. Right. So I had to quick kind of just trace the main components um, of the, the, the photo and then I would just fill it in later. And so that kind of, by the time it came that I had a light box and I had all the time in the world, I still just roughed it in and then was done. So. Yeah. Okay. Cause, uh, like I said, I expect a very precise like get the ruler out kind of thing, but, uh, Oh no, nope. <laughs> yeah. And that's just pencil. You're just penciling that on the canvas. I don't use pencil cause it rubs off. I learned that Thank the you. hard way. Thank you. <laughs> so I do use, um, like permanent ink markers, but I use only grayscale so I can make it as light, um, as it is for me to see. Um, so I don't like using black cause sometimes that'll show through depending on the stitch. So, I try and keep it as light gray as possible. Okay, now that makes sense to me. Yeah, I was trying to understand from the photos because yeah, I'm I'm with you, and uh, I mean I have a no what a hard pencil. I don't know what it is that sometimes I'll mark, but I don't like mm -hmm. to because you know that graphite's going to come off sooner or later. Yeah, um, exactly. And it will always I... come off on white, right where it's most visible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So then then. At some point, you just decide this is going to be my business, or are you? Uh, this is still my side. I work full time. Okay. Um, I I I work for the Grand Traverse Regional Community Foundation, so I do have a day job. Um, this is really my nights and um and weekends. Uh, I find since I transitioned jobs about a year and a half ago that I do have more time for art now that I don't work in art as much. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is, this is all on the side while I still work, you know, a full-time job. So, um, right now it's a hobby, but you know, we always, you know, that would be lovely if we could make, make a living out of it. Yeah. No, well, I, I, I wondered about that because, um, yeah, it's, it's, that'd be tough to do. Uh, there are people who do it full-time, but, mm -hmm. um, 
uh, challenging. And and you now you do an awful lot of exhibiting, and you sell the finished pieces. Is that mm-hmm. uh, is it create pieces and exhibit and sell them, or do you do commission work, or how does? Um, I've done a little bit of commission work, but really what I do is I create, I exhibit, and then sell. Um, you know, there's there's a few pieces that I have floating around our house that I am having a hard time parting with, although for the right price. <laughs> I think you can part with anything. Um, but, I, you know, I don't want it to just sit in my house. Like, I've already seen it. I've already enjoyed it. So I prefer it to move on um, to so that other people can enjoy it. Um, A few small commissions I've done, I've done people's homes, um, you know, just translated into a small, really six by six, I think is the biggest I've done. So Uh I don't, I don't particularly want to pursue commission work just because again, that's kind of taking my creativity out of it um, since I don't get to choose the subject. But um, there's been a few cases that the person's been close to me or, or there's been a specific reason I've done it, but um for the most part, it's it's just kind of create, exhibit, and and release. I guess. Well, I'm glad to hear that you you have some at least some pieces that are hard to part with because for me that would be, you know, to do an exhibit and have people tag it. You know, this is sold. This is sold. It, a piece of me would go out the door with every one of those. That'd be hard. Mm-hmm. And I still think you know each piece that that does sell. You know, you do kind of have to you know, a little sniffle and say goodbye to it. But at the same time, you know, you know that more people are going to enjoy it rather than it just sitting in, you know, in in, in your house and, you know, that might end up at Goodwill someday. So, yeah. yeah. (laughs) So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That problem. There's a lot of us going to have that problem sooner or later. I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Because the kids don't want it. I guarantee you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have the same discussions with my mom right now. And my daughter will look at me and go, please don't do, don't, don't leave that for me. I'm like, okay. I mean, she's 17. So, you know, she's a little more difficult to please right now, but, um, but yeah, I would rather them move on to good homes where people enjoy them. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, what types of scenes are you most drawn to these days? I mean, you guys have enough lighthouses to, uh, to do them for the rest of your life but uh are you like you, there was one one that you did with the uh the barn and what was the tobacco um oh the mail pouch tobacco mail pouch, barn yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's just such a classic michigan uh you know on the sides of barns all over the state uh, mm-hmm. so do you find yourself uh moving inland or is still a coastal look uh what appeals to you um, probably still more of a coastal look. Um, we were actually lucky enough two years ago to find a small cottage on the opposite side of the state on Lake Huron. So we, we travel between coasts quite often. Um, so, you know, when we're home, we travel up the Lake Michigan coast. And when we're there, we travel up the Lake Huron coast. Um, so that seems to be a lot of the scenes I end up doing. Um, but I also have, um, I guess a fascination with, with, um, buildings, and historic homes um, and architecture. And I think that comes from my grandfather, who was an architect, and yeah. my dad, who was an engineer. So I have an appreciation for older buildings, and, and um, I enjoy doing those as well. Yeah. Yeah, I was glad to see the barns because uh, when, when I lived northwest of Chicago and would ride my bike out in cornfields and soybean fields, you know, for hours, and, and over the years, you watch those barns deteriorate. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's America. And, mm-hmm. you know, and then w- one day one would be down and it would, you know, they tore it down because nobody they can afford to keep it going, can't afford to upkeep. And I hated seeing those old barns go because, I mean, they're just classic buildings and everyone's different. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, preserving them through needlework, photography, whatever it is, is to me is really important. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yep. That's, um, well, keep doing them. Keep them alive. <laughs> <laughs> I try. Well, there was one um, lighthouse that I did. There's an island just off of uh, where our cottage is called Charity Island. And there's a Charity Island lighthouse, which has recently been beautifully renovated. It's gorgeous. You can stay the night on it. It's like an Airbnb or something. 
but I had stumbled across this image online of it before renovation. So it was falling down. There were holes in the roof. You know, there was rust running down the side of the tower. And I thought, that's the image I want to do. Yeah. I don't want to do the shiny, new, beautiful <laughs> lighthouse. I want to try and do this old, decrepit, falling down one. Um, so just trying to achieve a weathered look on siding and, and um, exposed brick and rust. And it was overgrown bushes. And so that was quite a challenge. Yeah. Yeah, I applaud Michigan for preserving so many of those lighthouses. It's uh, got to be expensive, but they're just oh, yeah. classic, classic things. Every one of them. They are. Yeah, yeah, they're great. All right, I got to know about uh, one of the things that everybody deals with. Do I put my name on my piece? <laughs> and your yeah. name tags. I got to know about your name tags because that is the solution. Yes. Um, so my husband just kept saying, like, you've got to figure out a way to sign your pieces. Cause I was exhibiting at this point, yeah. um, you know, and all artists sign the corner of their work. And I right. just, I, I couldn't figure out how to, how to, you know, do a signature and, and I'm not even sure really how I saw this. I think I was just, um, scrolling Etsy because we were getting married. And so of course you look at Etsy for everything. And um, I saw a little leather tag that was going on a crocheted hat somebody made, you know, and it says made with love, Jennifer or whatever. And I thought, huh. And so I found this company um, called local, local laser co. And I got the smallest tag they had. And I, they had like 12 or 14 different fonts you could choose from. So I chose the font that looked like a signature, like cursive. Um, and now I sew those into the lower corner of all of my pieces. It is so it so looks cool. like my signature. So yeah. so it, it is a piece of leather then? Mm -hmm, that they laser engrave yep, and then, with whatever you want. And then do they punch the holes on the ends? Yep, they do. Because it's just so slick. Because I just finished a sampler, a uh, reproduction sampler a couple months ago. And I got all done. It's like, oh, now I got to stitch my name in it. It's like, oh. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't yeah. want to, you know, I just don't <laughs> want to. Yeah. And then when yeah. I saw yours where I would just do two stitches and that's done. And, yep. Oh yeah. It's excellent. Yeah. That's been one of my favorite discoveries. <laughs> yeah. So local laser co on Etsy. Yep. Yep. And they, their turnaround is super fast. And like, I think the day after I got married, I placed an order with my new married name for my new tags and you know, they've, they've just been great to work with. Now, all right, okay. These, these, this is nuts and bolts stuff, but I got to know. Uh, <laughs> would you have to order a quantity, like fifty or a hundred, or? It was less than that. I know they. I think they had the lowest was maybe twelve. Oh. So you don't have to place a huge order. That was the other thing I liked. I could place a small enough order to see if I liked it, to see if it worked, and um, super, super reasonable. Hmm. Because that's the solution for me. Oh. Yeah. That's yeah. Perfect. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. No, it's perfect. And then the other one, okay, we're, we're going to get to the, your master needlework program here in a minute, but I also mm -hmm. got to know, because I have a dental pick uh, that I yes. got from a dentist for, uh, like, doing, I, I tend to stitch on really small count uh, linen, and, and a 40 count is kind of my standard. And mm -hmm. sometimes I just need a little small something to get in there to cut something out. And I, a uh, uh, dentist gave me, he says, oh, I've got a bunch of these that are all worn out in terms of for dentistry. So he gave uh -huh. me one and I find myself using it from time to time. But, um, uh, you, you're making use of a, of a pick with some regularity. I do. Yeah. And, and I think it's just in the last few pieces that I've created, I've gotten more comfortable with stripping down my six strand floss, um, to use smaller sizes. And so. Um, doing all the intricate detail work, yeah, I find myself having to to use it to pull threads out of the way for me to place a very specific one. Um, I mean, I've even incorporated chip clips to clamp onto the pick so I can clamp it to the side of the canvas so it pulls it so I can do extensive work. So uh. um, it was it was a great purchased again that's not just off of amazon just a dental pick set i, I mean obviously i don't use the mirror <laughs> right you know right. but but i've used tweezers and 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 a couple of the picks so 
Yeah, that's uh, well. I know mine's come in, and and the ends are curved so strangely that they come. They actually end up being very handy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they don't get in the way, and yeah, right. no, that's been a great tool. Yep. Well, that should be a new market for dentistry tool makers. <laughs> Needlework. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. So tell me about that. You're doing the A and G Master Needle Artist Program. What I am. What What got you to do that? I mean, that's an undertaking. It is. Um, so I guess part of it was in just chatting with some of my colleagues in the art center and gallery world. Um, I was really looking honestly for legitimacy for what I was doing. Mm. Um, I had somebody say to me, you know, maybe you're not getting accepted into shows because people don't understand. You're not just doing a painted canvas. Like this is a hundred percent original, a hundred percent your work, you know? So I, 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 stopped using the word needlepoint. I stuck with fiber art. You know, I tried just tweaking a couple of different things and I thought, you know, it'd be great if I had some initials after my name that could demonstrate to people that I've mastered this. Like this is an actual thing. Like it's an (laughs) art form. Uh Um, And that's how I found the um, American Needlepoint Guilds program. And, you know, they have them for, for jurors, instructors, needle pointers, Um, But their needle artist program, I thought, fit me a little bit more because it was a little bit more about the freedom and the creativity to make make needle work your own. Um, So I reached out to them and asked them, like, what what it entailed. And they put me in touch with the chair and she explained the process that it was a two year process um, and that I had to do this application, which turned out to be like at least a dozen pages by the time I was done with the application. Um, And the first year you focus on doing research and writing a thesis around a needlework subject. Um, So mine was the, um, the, the use of samplers in women's education in early America. So um, then year two, you create an original work kind of derivative of your thesis. Um, And so I created a sampler that depicts the great lakes and the, um, bathometry, bathometry, the depths of the Great Lakes. Um, so actually, I'm just waiting to hear back from my chair on whether or not I've passed. Oh, <laughs> so, oh so you're at like, the end of it then. Oh, I'm at, I'm at the end. Yeah. Um, I think I still have to present at conference um, is one of the final things and then have part of my thesis published in Needle Pointers magazine. Mm. So, so I'm just waiting for word. Yeah, I'm just waiting for word and it's about two weeks overdue. So... <laughs> Hurry up. <laughs> I know. I've been just checking my email, like refreshing it multiple times a day. So, um, but it's a great program. It really does um, force you to think about your thread placement and your color choices. They are, there's, there's a huge section on understanding color theory, which was um, hugely valuable to me. Um, you know, a, a, a light blue isn't just a light blue there's light blues that are slightly green or slightly gray or slightly purple. And, you know, so the things that I've learned in the, I don't, I didn't take the full two years. So less than two years um, has been extremely valuable and has, has definitely developed me as an artist. So it sounds like a lot of work and um, you know, it can be, but they give you plenty of time to get it done. They walk with you hand in hand through the whole process Mm -hmm. and they're super supportive. And I, you know, like I said, I haven't heard if I've passed, but it's been such a great experience and I've learned so much in the experience that I would recommend it to anybody. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's it's interesting looking for legitimacy because that's a discussion we've had and actually we've had it uh, more often with people from Europe, Uh, but exhibiting and how, textile needle arts are not viewed as art when it comes to oil and sculpture and watercolor and, you know, and all those old classic, uh, art forms. And, mm-hmm. uh, it, I mean, you exhibit so much you, you, so, so that question has come up, but, but not been a real issue for you. Um, I mean, I think I, I was not accepted into shows because there uh, is a pre preconceived notion and, and, I luckily have a friend who's also still in the art center field, who's a fiber artist. And her and I have had many discussions on 
um, you know, traditional women's work or traditional hobby work not being considered yeah. fine art. Yeah, that. And yeah, um, yeah that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I just think that the more people can get out and talk about it, um, I think that I I do think that that those tides are turning. Like I think that they're it's becoming more accepted, and part of it is the the resurgence in these crafts. I mean, my daughter picked up crocheting. You know, a lot of millennials are are really fueling this this new almost craft movement um, of bringing back some of the traditional forms and making them more mainstream and less hobby. So bringing them out of the living room and you know into the gallery space more. Yeah, that women's work thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> or, or or as my dad when when I was having some conversation at some point. And mentioned about uh, doing, you know, needle arts or needlework uh, mm-hmm. podcast, and he looked at me and said, "Sewing? <laughs> no, yeah. Dad, no. Just never mind. Just never, never mind. mind. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll be here all day or, trying to get you to understand. Just forget it." <laughs> well, you know, and there's, it, you know, I would say not a show goes by without somebody going, "Oh my gosh, I love that punch embroidery you do." <laughs> like, oh. no, it's it's not punch embroidery, you know. But and then just trying. To explain the difference between all the different needleworks is, um, you know, that could be a full time job as well. <laughs> yeah. Do you find an appreciation within the artist community for what you do? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And I and I think that you know until you've done it and you realize how long they take and how much time and patience and blood, sweat, and tears you put into this work. Um, you don't really understand or appreciate it. I mean, I look back at some of my grandmother's things that have hung on our walls as long as I can remember, and I have a whole new appreciation for what she did. She made each of her grandkids individualized samplers when they were born. Oh, wow. You know, so you look back at that and you're like, there's no way she bought that. So she created that, and then she spent all this time on it for five grandchildren and then a great grandchild. And You know, so I think artists themselves do have a greater appreciation because they see how much work and time goes into things like that. And they know how much of yourself goes into things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe that's even more important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. Definitely. Yeah. When you do exhibits, is it like an say an exhibit comes up? Do you Mm -hmm. uh, or you see one in the future and you want to want to exhibit at it? Do you create for that or do you use what you've created to create an exhibit, if that makes sense? Yeah. Um, so most of the ones that I have been in, I have something already created. A lot of them are an, what I call open calls, that they're just like a, a member show of an art center or um, there's no theme related. It's just a fiber show. Um there's been a couple that have more specific themes, um, but I can't think of anything recently that I made specifically for a show because the majority of them are juried. So you never know if you're going to get in anyway. Mm-hmm. And I'd really hate to like apply for a, a hot dog show and create a hot dog piece and then get not get in and then be <laughs> stuck with this hot dog piece, just <laughs> as an example. But um, so normally I try and look at what I've already got that would apply. So I recently heard I was in a show just north of here and the theme was by hand. So the focus is art by hand, not Uh machine made, not AI generated art by hand. Um, But then I'm getting ready to apply to a show actually on Mackinac Island and their theme is Mackinac rocks. Well, I don't have anything that's just like rocks. I have a few pieces that have rocks in them. So, you know, it's just kind of how you write your, artist statement to Mm -hmm. adhere to what their criteria is yeah that whole that whole west coast of michigan is there's just an awful lot of artists Mm -hmm. at least that's been my perception just an awful lot of artist uh activity in general saugatuck comes to mind Uh, oh yes yeah yeah just heavy so it's yeah a world where it's pretty easy to find that yeah it is and there's lots of opportunities um just in the region of michigan i live in which is northwest lower michigan we have i would say in about a 10 county region hundreds of arts and culture organizations 
And so, you know, you can belong to half a dozen of them that do different shows and open calls. Um, I also look at call for entry online cafe and I look for fiber shows. So right now, actually, I have a piece out in Virginia at Woodlawn, um, which is the annual needlework show. Right. And um, I've had pieces in Georgia and, you know, obviously I ship them all, but, um, but yeah, just wherever I can try and find an opening that I think a piece of my work would fit, I just kind of, you know, throw it at the wall and see what sticks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, a lot of people are afraid to do that. So, so there's one at Woodlawn you're waiting to hear about, huh? Well, that one, actually, I just got a call today. The show doesn't open until March 1st, um, but I... Apparently there was an issue with my, the wire on the back of my piece and it fell. So oh. they were calling me in a panic about what to do. And, and she said, and I, I'm so bummed, but you got a second place ribbon. Oh. <laughs> so, so that was kind of fun to hear. And, you know, I told her not to worry about it, that it happens all the time, that the the artwork wasn't damaged, just the frame. And I wasn't too worried about it. So they're yeah. going to figure out how to display it and it will go on display, but. Well, I'm sure um, they'll do a good yeah. job. So congratulations there. So kind of a, a backhanded way of finding out you got a second, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. But they 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 do such such a nice job out there of displaying the needlework in you know this antique historic home, and it's it's really a great show. Yeah, I've only seen pictures. Have you actually been? No, <laughs> this yeah. is my second year in it, but. Um, they're very nice. I've, I've reached out to them and they always send me photos of my work and of the rest of the exhibit. And if you follow them on Facebook, they do a great job of documenting the exhibition. Yeah. Yeah. No, it looks like it'd be one of those destination things, plan a trip and go. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Now, I was also interested when it comes to this whole concept of, of, of needlework as art is it, Plain air, plain air stitching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this was an art center just north of me and I was in a show and I got an email from the gallery person. She had just kind of blanketed all the artists in the show and said, we want to do these, you know, interactive evenings where people can come by and check out the show and meet some artists and you guys could do plain air painting. Like it was kind of a generic email. And I responded just to her and went, well, as you know, I don't paint, but I guess I could come and set up and plain air stitch. And she loved the idea. So that's what we did. I loaded up my stand and the project I had going right then. And we went and the, the weather was gorgeous. And we sat outside of this art center and I didn't get a lot of stitching done. It was more a lot of talking with people and showing them my work. But um, it was a lot of fun. And I thought, well, OK, I guess I've started a thing. I can plain air stitch now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, one of our co-hosts, Cindy, uh, uh, her uh, local guild, they have, I think they do it every month, where they go to a library and stitch, uh, get a table in a library and stitch. And mm -hmm. uh, they've, they've converted a few, more than a few people, uh, from what I understand. Uh, you know, oh, stop, that's fantastic. Yeah, stop by and ask about it and, yeah, uh, put a needle in their hands and let's go. So Yeah, definitely. That's a, that's great fun. So so you got a bunch of people sitting around painting and you're sitting there stitching. That's all right. Yeah. Yeah, we had a we had a photographer and I think two painters and then myself that night. So it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, and I can imagine the uh conversation the stitching doesn't happen because the conversation gets going, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there were quite a few people interested in my setup um with my stand and and you know, I think their favorite thing that night was to turn it over and see the back of my canvas. Because <laughs> I don't think, you know, it doesn't occur to people like the front looks so orderly and nice that, it, you know, you turn it over and you're like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I was intrigued by that. Uh, you, you had one photo somewhere uh, showing the backside because mm -hmm. for me, I know a lot of stitchers, you know, no, you can't look at the back. No, no, no. <laughs> but that's how I for me, I love it because that's how I learned. Uh, mm -hmm. how you go about it and um uh, i enjoyed i actually spent a lot of time uh, studying that one photo because you just go mm -hmm. for it you don't uh, I do. <laughs> yeah yeah you don't yeah, worry about the true. backside at all you just go for it yeah i do which can sometimes work to my detriment part of the um 
the application process for the master needle artist program was you had to do a six by six stitch sampler and they wanted pictures of the back. So I really had to buckle down that day um, (laughs) that I was working on that. And, you know, my husband kept noticing me frogging and I'm like, you don't get it. They're going to look at the back. (laughs) (laughs) So, but with the rest of my stuff, yeah, no, I don't, I, you know, not, not many people want to know how the sausage is made. So Right. I don't worry too much about the back right. of my canvas. <laughs> yeah, and see, I'm one of those that 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 wouldn't even have made me flinch. My back is uh, uh, as clean as can be most of the time. I don't know, yeah. don't know why I'm like that, but um, I, I admire the freedom of just. <laughs> all right, I'm done here. I'm moving over here and just. Yep. Yep. Bring it up over <laughs> here and go for it. Yep. Well, yeah. and there's times that I'll actually have that internal conversation with myself. Like, okay, now do I just pull this through and snip it and then start over here? And then I'm like in my head going, estimating the amount of thread that I yep. use after pulling it and snipping it and starting anew versus just dragging it across the canvas. And I'm like, you know what? There's 60 cents a skein. Just drag it across the canvas. <laughs> 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 yep. Yep. I've had that uh, that conversation in my head too. Wait a minute. This is going to take an inch here and an inch here. Yeah. yeah. Not, but I weave mine under. Um I can't. Oh, okay. I can't yeah. deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if I do that, I I have to weave it under. So I'll spend more time than it would have taken to end it and start a new one uh weaving it under just because I can't help it. You know. <laughs> yeah. Everybody has their process. That's it's right. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, all right, so then, when it comes to exhibits, I, I just have to know these things. When you finish a piece, do you immediately uh, mount it and frame it so it's ready to go, or do you have a drawer full of pieces that are just there? Oh no, I mount it and frame it. I just think it's more protected that way. Oh, okay. <clears throat> um, and you know, I'll, I on most of them, I do a binding stitch and then I attach it into a shadow box. There's been a few times I've wrapped it around a canvas board just to give it a little bit more of a finished look. Mm -hmm. Um, But no, they go, they go right into a frame. Oh, okay. Okay. Cause I know there's a lot of people out there that have drawers full of just canvases laying there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when it comes to an exhibit, then uh, you're, you're pretty much ready to go. Just select what you want to exhibit and, or what fits yeah, the theme. Yeah, and then and... fill out the paperwork. And... Yeah. Yeah, and we have a section of hallway in our house that my husband hangs his paintings and I hang my pieces. And it's ever-changing because he'll take a piece down to put into a show and I'll bring a piece back and hang it back up. And so <laughs> the artwork is constantly changing in our hallway because we're uh, taking them down and sending them in and, you know, replacing purchased ones. And so. How cool is yeah. that? You guys must have great fun. <laughs> We do. We really do. Yeah. Wow. Your daughter uh, interested or is she doing the teenager thing? Like, I want nothing to do with what my parents do. No, she's very interested and she's very supportive. I think the first time we took her to a gallery where our stuff was on the wall, she was just kind of um, dumbfounded. She she mm. just couldn't believe it. And, um, you know, this she's is real. Pre- <laughs> yeah. She's like, oh, wow. Like, do like it like it's not just you two telling each other you like their work yeah um and you know she she's um in band and she's in theater and she crochets and she sketches so she's creative as well oh, okay. um but yeah no she's she's not a super typical 17 year old she's extremely <laughs> supportive and proud of us <laughs> and will uh, brag about us too so that's nice. uh, that's so cool so uh, so that culture continues then just creativity top to bottom yeah yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yep. Well, that's great. Well, thanks so much. Wow, what a whew, what a world you live in. Great fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 it is. Yep. All right, so what's the what's the next exhibit so people can hunt it down? Uh, well, right now, um, I like I mentioned, I'll be at Woodlawn for the month of March, and then I have a piece at Glen Arbor Art Center opening in their new show in March, and. I actually just closed a show in Petoskey. So, um, uh, yeah. So right now, Glen Arbor and Woodlawn, and then I guess more to come. Right. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> All right. Yep. Well, fantastic. So folks can find you uh, on Instagram, Rogue Needlepoint, and roguenedlepoint.com is your website. Uh, yep. Mercedes, thanks. Oh, this is this is great fun. Good for you. Bravo. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yep. 
Thanks for doing this, and thanks to everyone for listening.